we are now is uh, there's is very exciting time to be alive. Technology has exploded, uh, both hardware and software technology. Uh, we've improved the way we do things. We're talking about driverless cars coming. You know, America is uh, setting out guidelines for uh, driverless car technology. And so it will not be unusual to see that in the near future, you get into a car, but there's no driver. And they think it might actually be safer. The new technology that is emerging where you can take a small capsule. Essentially, you can swallow the capsule and the capsule will be in your system, and that capsule will track the circulation, it follows circulatory system, and if there's an impending plaque rupture, you'll get a ring attack link ringtone, a heart attack ringtone on your cell phone. You know, it's telling you that a heart attack is about to happen, so head to the nearest emergency room, right? So it's quite fascinating. It's been developed at the Scripps Institute, and that's one of the things Eric Topol is working about. But that's not the only thing going on using your cell phone to do a simple eye exam. And with that, about 80% of pathologic conditions in the eye could be detected, and many of those things are potentially curable. And so when they're picked up at an early stage, the patient has a better expectation. Then there are also nanosensor tattoos, which are like a simple tattoo that will be in the system. And you flash the phone with the software in the phone, download it in the phone, and it's an app. And it can pick a lot of things. You can use it to track iron levels for people with anemia. You can use it to track the, uh, dehydration in athletes. We can also use it to look at basic metabolic profiles. You know, so it can do a lot of things. So these nanosensor tattoos are already out there and they're being used in some quarters. So that's what technology is all about. But the problem is there's still a huge global imbalance in the way technology is applied, especially to healthcare. Those that need it the most do not have access to it, right? And that is the unfortunate uh, story of our lives. Um, but this is not a new story. It's really an old story. Uh, if you go back for those who study history, uh, there is an Italian economist, Vilfredo Pareto. In 1906, he made a simple observation that 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population, right? And that Pareto's principle of Pareto's rule still applies. In Nigeria today, if you look at ownership of land, I'm sure you'll get the same thing. Uh, we'll find about 20% of people will own about 80% of the property. If you look at global GDP, you'll see that 60% at the bottom control only 6% of global GDP. So if you take this to healthcare, you also see that 80% of the healthcare needs have access to only 20% of the resources for healthcare. 80% of the resources are res resident with 20% of the people. And that's a very inequitable, uh, inequitable uh, condition. We need to solve it. But the fastest and the easiest way to solve this will be education and technology, right? Because education will change the social, um, economic environment for people. Poverty is a nexus, right? If you have better education, you get better job, you have better health status, you have access, you have capital. But there are a lot of things required to solve the socioeconomic condition. We cannot do that. But technology breaks down barriers. Technology makes it easy to scale, makes it easy to get access to what people are not necessarily able to afford. But if you take, you know, my, I'm a cardiologist by training, so much of my work is focused on cardiovascular diseases. Uh, Non-communicable diseases are a major problem to development in the 21st century. Until you get a handle of that, you're going to have problems with uh, development. Uh, if you look at deaths around the world, you have about nearly 60 million people die each year. About 60% of those people die in developing countries. 
that will be about 35 million. The problem is 28 million, about 80% of that is from non-communicable diseases, right? But the bigger problem is that 50%, that's 40 million, are preventable. So think about, we can prevent 40 million people from dying if we do the right things. But my position is that technology will help us do the right things. But there are a lot of misconceptions about technology. For many years, the third world or the developing world have been brainwashed and fed on a steady diet that technology is not good for us, right? I'm glad that the um, minister in, you know, recognizes that primary health care you know, is not just about polyclinics where you just have staff. You can also bring technology into delivering primary health care services, and that makes it a lot easier. But to tell us that technology is not applicable for developing countries is a misconception. Technology improves lives, improves quality of care. Technology makes uh, it possible to deliver care to people in distant areas without the limitations of geography or physical barriers. And that is why it's important. How many people here have a landline? Can you tell me your landline number? How many people have a cell phone? How many people have more than one cell phone? All right, so that is it. Um, how many people write letters? How many times have you written letters to your relatives and friends? How many people send emails? How many people send text messages? Right? Does, well, the younger people here, do you know what a telegram is? Okay, so that is the, that's the problem. So to tell us that technology is not applicable for developing countries is the same thing as telling us to continue to write letters and wait for three weeks for the letters to get to London and wait another three weeks for them to reply, right? Now you send an email. If you don't get a response in 30 seconds, you wonder if something is wrong or you send a text message, you use WhatsApp. These same technologies, and there's Facebook Messenger, right? All of these technologies can also be deployed in one form or another to improve healthcare. But we're not doing a good job at doing that. Now, it will not be as important for people in the United States or UK that have ready access to high quality care, but they still use that technology but it has more meaning for us here. If you have one cardiologist in Abuja, you can deploy care for that cardiologist to serve people in Kaduna, in Sokoto, in Medugri, and elsewhere. But it's more difficult to expect to have a cardiologist in all of these locations, at least not yet in Nigeria, because of obvious constraints, right? We have stethoscope that is commonly used in medicine. Now, that is where, you know, my colleagues in cardiology think my proposal is a little bit radical because I think the time for the stethoscope in cardiology is over. The stethoscope is dead and buried, but we still carry a stethoscope around as cardiologists. It's a badge of honor, right? Because if you have your stethoscope around your neck, then you don't have to announce to anybody you're a doctor, right? So. That's why there's so much reluctance in letting go of the stethoscope. But truthfully, what do we do as cardiologists? We use the stethoscope to listen to heart sounds, right? We listen to heart murmurs, we listen to all kinds of things. If we think we're hearing something we should not be hearing, what's our next step? We send the person to get an echocardiogram. That's an ultrasound. If we thought we heard something, and the echocardiogram says it's not there. We say, hmm, I wonder why I was hearing that, right? But we never turn around and say the echo is wrong because the echo is direct visualization of what you thought you were hearing. But guess what? In the olden days, you used to have bulky echo machines. We still have them. And those bulky echo machines will cost about 500,000 US dollars to buy. Most Clinicians can't afford those. 
you know, so it was a necessary second or third step. But there are miniaturized systems now. When I see patients in my office, I carry around a V-scan. That is a small, it's like a, my iPhone, right? So you go into the patient, I don't even waste my time. So you just drop the V-scan, the, the probe on the patient's chest, and then you look and see what you see. So the V-scan has replaced the stethoscope, but it's not yet universally adopted, right? But by the way, I'm not just plugging for GE. There are other makers of miniaturized you know, systems. So if you think about that and then see, we are in the era of V-scan to look at cardiac ultrasound. We have those small miniaturized systems that can do ultrasound. And all of those systems also have wireless technologies as well. You're able to take that picture and you're able to send that picture out to an expert to look at it. Now, imagine a situation where, you know, so it takes, I can't tell you how many, you know, it takes nearly 20 years to train a competent cardiologist, right? So, but you can train somebody as an ultrasound tech in two to three years. We can take a lot of people, train them in ultrasound, and deploy them all over Nigeria, and they can do ultrasound, they can do echocardiograms, and that can migrate into a cloud server, and somebody can log in. You can have just a few cardiologists log in and look at it, and provide advice to the GP or the general practitioner in the rural area. And with that, you break a lot of barriers right away. But somebody in New York will not be thinking about that because there are 1,000 cardiologists. All they're thinking about is how do we cut down the number of cardiologists? We're thinking about how do we increase the number? But we cannot increase the number you know, fast enough because people are dying. I just showed you that 14 million, one four, 14 million deaths are preventable, but we cannot wait until we get enough people trained. So that is where technology is going. You have remote patient monitoring services, right? Many people with hypertension don't need to be running to the doctor's office every month or every two months or every three months. There are ways to monitor those uh, patients with hypertension, with diabetes. Many people are interested in weight loss and want to be monitored. So there are so many applications now that are available from so many companies that you can check your blood pressure. That blood pressure is immediately transferred to your Android or iPhone just because of Bluetooth technology. When that is transferred, then the next thing that happens, it immediately is transferred to a cloud server, and there is a dashboard, and there may be somebody in Sweden looking at your blood pressure and says, Mr. Johnson, your blood pressure is up. You need to go get it checked. I want to show you what we do at the Heart Institute of the Caribbean. Um, we, because we understood what technology is capable of doing and how technology can be deployed in developing countries. I was on faculty at Vanderbilt University uh, many, many years ago. And um, we started thinking about that. So then with a few people we left 12 years ago, we built the Heart Institute of the Caribbean in Jamaica, in Kingston, Jamaica. And this is um, where we have uh, deployed the same things I'm talking about here in taking care of patients. Uh, we have several locations in Jamaica, uh, but the most important thing with what we do is that we use technology, we use electronic medical records, we use telemedicine technology, we use remote patient monitoring services. All of those things we have brought you know, into our practice, and that has been done successfully. And some years ago, we came down and said, OK, we'll have to try to implement the same things in Nigeria. Um, in 2013, we established a, what we call Docs Heart Center in Enugu uh, to provide you know, routine cardiovascular services. You have to start somewhere, right? If you're waiting until you can start at the top, you will never get started. So that center in Enugu now is able to provide 
uh, stress testing, ECG, whole time monitoring, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. The basic cardiovascular services are available at the Docs Heart Center in Enugu. And now we're working on putting a national medical call center in place there. The infrastructure is built, and then we are now going to leverage you know, some talent to finally get it in place because one of the key problems we notice in Africa is lack of access to medical information. You know, so what do doctors do? We look for information, analyze the information, and provide recommendations. Now, patients need information as well. If you don't have information, people die. So the most basic thing can be a very, the most critical thing can be a very simple problem to solve if you have the right person talking to you. All over the world, you have 911 services where if people have a medical emergency, they pick up the phone and call and the trained personnel will talk to them. We don't have that luxury in Nigeria. We don't, we, you know, we have a long way to go. There are things that we have to solve, but we have to start somewhere in solving those problems. So we think that universal access to health information is a very important you know, uh, battle to win in this war against, you know, um, against ill health, right? If you want to improve the quality of life of people, you have to give them access to reliable information. We have a problem in Nigeria where you have a lot of quacks that run around with um, what they call those uh, damfo buses with loudspeakers, you know, telling people whatever they are applying will cure everything, including death, you know, and that's what people, you know, believe, right? So when people do not have access, they are vulnerable to abuse. We're trying to resolve that problem through the call center initiative. If we have that going, then we have a problem. Uh, we, we, when people have a problem, then they can pick up the phone and then call. The way we've designed it is that it has a call line interface. So if you register with up to three telephone numbers, we get your medical records. When you make the phone call, your medical records will appear on the screen and the doctor sitting at the site know exactly who you are, what you are. And then it is also designed to be able to transmit information to your providers wherever you are. So Mr. Johnson calls from Accuray. Maybe it is because you travel for a conference and you forgot your blood pressure medication. Then you don't know what to do. It's 2 a.m. It is Sunday. And you don't have access. You call. If you call the number, a doctor can advise you and say, this is what you do. If you have to get a temporary retrieve, they will be able to direct you to a nearest pharmacy because, and that information can also be sent to that pharmacy or to the doctors from the system. So it's a very robust system that we've developed an infrastructure for, and we're hoping to launch that in a very short order. Thank you.